Um, welcome everybody. Today we're talking about adding verification to the FreeBSD loader. Let's see if this works. Good. All right. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of background about verified exec in Junos. Um, I'll talk a briefly about secure boot because that's obviously sort of the motivation for this sort of thing. Um, I'm going to talk quite a bit about the manifests that we use for that. Um, and then I'll get into the loader environment, how it's different from what we've been using for the last uh, almost two decades. And then question and answers. And I mean, if you have a sufficiently burning question, don't, don't uh, hold your breath. You can interject any time. So uh, let me see. Um, a little bit before 2005, uh, we signed a contract with some huge customer to do FIPS 140-2. Um, and after they'd signed the contract, they came to me and said, how long would it take you to do this? And I told them three years. And they said, you've got 18 months. Um, so we did. Um, we did make the deadline, which was good, because there was some, apparently some fairly massive contractual penalties if we didn't. Um, but because of the compressed timeline, um, this is back in the days when if you wanted to do FIPS 140-2, you had two choices. You either had a common criteria evaluated operating system, or you had what was called a limited operating environment. And since doing a common cr criteria evaluation at the level required would have taken three years all by itself, um, I opted to go for the limited operating environment. And that's why we brought in Verified Exec from NetBSD. Um, one of the first things I did for it was to add the, uh, the signing of the manifests so that it actually was more secure. Um, and this is back when Junos was based on FreeBSD somewhere around 4. Um, so there was no Mac framework, none of that sort of stuff. And so we had to raise secure level to um, protect the verified exec state from naughty, naughty administrators and stuff like that. And unfortunately, uh, raising secure level um, interfered a lot with the box doing what it needed to do. And so I had to make a number of fairly ugly hacks to secure level. Um, adjusting the levels at which it would restrict various things. All of which meant that none of this was suitable for upstreaming. Um, so that, that all happened in, in 2005. And in fact, our, our support folk liked this so much, they asked us to put it in the general release um, that same year. Um, we added this uh, boot minus x option, which gave, you, gave us a safety net, because we're talking about suddenly running the internet with this stuff enabled. And uh, we didn't like the idea of you know, the internet crashing because um, somebody had some weird problem. So we gave our support guys this, this safety belt saying, you can you know, interrupt the boot, do boot minus x, and for that one boot, it will come up with verified exec disabled. You can solve your problem, tell us what it was, and we'll, we'll do something about it. I, this is like almost 15 years ago. They assured me that they've never had to use it. Um, the whole point of this for the general, uh, ignoring FIPS now, because that's when we're no longer interested in that. But for the general purpose, the, the whole reason here is that it's a good way to block script kiddies. Um, those of you who are interested in uh, protecting systems, you've got a spectrum of threats that you need to deal with. At one end of the spectrum, you've got the very highly skilled, very motivated, you know, lots of resources and so on, your state actors or people like Jonathan. Um, it's very hard to stop somebody like that, especially if they have physical presence. At the other end of the spectrum, you've got a huge population of what we call script kiddies. These are, these are people who can log into a box, run a tool, and if it gives them root, whoopee. But if it doesn't, they have no idea what to do. So they just go on to the next target. Um, and because of that, uh, over the years, this has provided us with uh, some decent mitigation for a lot of famous vulnerabilities. Um, and our CERT team in particular, I've been very pleased about the fact that we didn't have to do fire drills to republish and re-release Junos you know, when a, a, uh, a highly popular CVE comes out the day after you've just done a release. So when we, uh, in, a few years ago, uh, we bit the bullet and we decided to carve up Junos such that we could run it on a virtually stock FreeBSD. Uh, this was targeting FreeBSD 10 at the time. And one of my colleagues, Steve Kay, who's also a FreeBSD committer, um, he basically re-implemented Verified Exec as a Mac module. Um, 
this was a much neater solution. It meant we could uh, put it into virtually a stock kernel, um, and it's it's all very clean for upstreaming. It makes it uh, much nicer. And we've been able to extend that to, to do lots of other stuff as well. All right, so I'm going to talk a bit about manifests. Um, they are literally just a list of path names, fingerprints, and you can also add some flags. One of the nice things uh, in particular, and so I've got some various examples. Um, so we use SHA-1 uh, for, OK, back to FIPS for a sec. Um, it's still OK to use something like SHA-1 for a, what they call a firmware integrity test. Um, SHA-1 is deprecated for pra practically every other purpose. Um, but for a firmware integrity test, SHA-1 is still allowed. And although we have support in the kernel for SHA-256, we're not planning to use it until NSA or whoever forces to, um, just for the extra cost, because um, nobody likes the boot time taking more, than, uh, more time than it needs to. Um, so the manifest provides us a mapping of a path name to a fingerprint. And the fingerprint is obviously what the, the program should match. Um, but we also have a bunch of flags um, on the second entry. Uh, the very exec binary itself has a flag called trusted. Um, we overload, I overload this quite a bit, but it, it means a number of things. Most of which it means is that we've carefully audited that program and we trust it to do stuff that we wouldn't let anything else do. And so dev very exec, for example, will not allow itself to be opened by any process which isn't trusted. Um, so you've got a sort of a chicken and egg thing there. Um, the other interesting one is the indirect flag on the Python binary. Um, Python's a, a wonderful pro, uh, language, um, despite the lack of braces. Um, but uh, as much as I'd like to let our, our people write Python scripts and run signed Python scripts, we don't want anybody writing, uh, running the Python interpreter directly, um, because that's like giving your script kiddies a C compiler. Um, so, what that indirect flag does is, when the kernel's going to exec Python, it will allow it to run as the interpreter of a script, but that's it. So you still have to have a signed script, you still have to have a signed Python binary, um, but you can only run signed scripts, you can't run Python itself. And we modif I modified Python some years ago so that it also enforces that everything that it reads is also verified. Um, so it gives us a reasonable thing. And the, the Python language itself is relatively easy to audit for dangerous constructs, unlike some other languages. Um, much more recently, I've added the ability to add Mac labels to the manifest, um, which is part of another talk. Um, but it's, it basically gives us a secure means of doing lots of very useful things. Um, and we can also, the no ptrace one, basically we apply that to anything that we think is remotely sensitive, and that just means you can't run a debugger against it. So this gives us lots of good stuff. Um, a quick aside here on the packages that we use in Junos today, just because it'll make some of the subsequent slides make a little bit more sense. Um, and so you don't need to remember any of these details because they're not particularly important. It's just to make some of the, other, the following stuff make sense. So we have a package.xml provides all of the, um, the meta info about the package. The package contains a signed manifest which describes all of its contents. That's important for the package system to be able to verify the package and also to render anything inside it executable. Um, most of the content in most of our packages is actually in its own ISO image, CD960. And those ISO images have their own signed manifest inside them, such that once they're mounted, we load that verify and load that manifest into the kernel so that all the content of the ISO becomes executable. But some packages have um, stuff that's needed by the loader. So for instance, the kernel package has a bunch of stuff in a subdirectory called boot. And, and you'll see later the way the packages are, um, are installed. Um, the loader has no trouble finding this stuff. Um, and for the kernel package, his content star ISO is in that boot directory because it also gets preloaded by the loader. Uh, this is what a more normal package looks like. Um, you 
even the stuff in scripts is, is uncommon. That's a special case. So most of them just have a contents.iso, a list of sim links, and the manifest to describe it all. And then here's another package which is of more interest to the loader. It's full of uh, modules that we need to load at runtime. And you'll also notice that each package can have its own little loader.conf. So we've taught the loader how to go and find all these loader.confs. These are all immutable files, so they're all signed. All right. Um, let me go back one. So for each, uh, each manifest, we have a certificate uh, chain in a certs file, or eCERTs if it's ECDSA, and which goes, so you've got manifest, uh, ECDSA signature, and an ECDSA certificate chain. And that's for the purpose of verifying the signature. And so we have um, you know, somewhere within the bowels of Juniper, it's actually on my floor, I think, um, a root CA, which allocates a, a number of other intermediate CAs. Um, really good idea if you're ever setting any of this stuff up. The hierarchy costs you nothing, so put it in place um, early. Um, it's much easier to um, change things this way. Um, and generally speaking, depending on the signature methods, um, there's all sorts of recommendations about how often you should use a, a key before you um, retire it. And obviously, your root CA and so on. They need to live forever, so the fewer times you use them, the better. Um, the package signing keys, we now replace those every year. So everything that we built this year will be signed with a 2018 key. Everything we signed last year was signed with a 2017 key. And we use separate keys for developer builds versus our release builds. Um, on our platforms that have secure boot, the customer can actually revoke the ability to run developer packages on them so that they can be assured they're only running the, the proper released stuff, which is good. And we keep, so the, the C, all the CA private keys are never on a network. They're kept in a laptop in a safe, which is in a locked room, which uh, like six people have access to and, and all that sort of nonsense. And we use uh, signing servers and HSMs to hold all the signing keys for the, everything else. All right, that's the background. So I mentioned the signatures. Um, in the Junos package that I, I listed before, we had a .sig as well as a .esig. Um, .sig is our old RSA with SHA-1 based um, signatures. It's all deprecated these days. Uh, we only use the ECDSA um, now. And, uh, but we still have to include the old signatures in the outermost wrapper of stuff so that you can install it on an ancient version of Junos that only knows how to do the RSA signatures. All right, so the user land, um, very exec program. Uh, you need to be root to run it because it needs to be able to open dev, very exec. Um, his joy in life is to open a manifest, verify it using that supplied certificate chain. Um, he actually has the trust store, which is all the, the trust anchors, the, those root copies of those root CA certificates, burned into him. Um, and if nothing else, that's important because uh, when, you're, when you're verifying a certificate, especially if you're in FIPS mode and the certificate fails to verify, you're potentially about to enter what's called a FIPS error state. Um, and one of the things that you want to do to avoid getting there is run a self-test to make sure that your certificate verification process actually works. Um, and that way you can distinguish that certificate failed because it's expired. I know that I actually work. Um, and so we, we also include a couple of uh, intermediate CA certificates in there just so that we can do that self-testing. Um, so as he's whiffling through that manifest that we saw earlier, he opens the path, whether it's, you know, SBIN or NIT or whatever, and he does an IOCTL to pass down that file descriptor along with the fingerprint, any flags and any labels and so on to the kernel, and the kernel then stashes that, the Mac very exec module stashes that away in his data store. And he's tracking stuff by dev inode and generation number. And that means that you can have file with multiple links, they'll all work nicely and you can add more links after the file's being verified to the kernel, it makes no difference. 
but you can't copy a file. If you take you know, bin sh, which is all signed and working, and you copy it to slash temp, it stops working. All right. So that's the, that's the, the loader. Um, it's worth mentioning in the uh, user land with the kernel, macro exec, and so on, we have to deal with the, the concept that you know, programs get run hundreds of times. Um, and packages get replaced and so on. And so the, the whole process has to be optimized for um, running stuff many times. The loader environment is very different. Um, and uh, so just quickly, we, the, what we want here is we want to verify the kernel and the modules and anything else that we load for the kernel. And you can't really have secure boot if you don't have the loader verifying this stuff. Um, this, by the way, has been on my roadmap ever since 2005 when we first did Verified Exec, because you've got hardware power on, and Verified Exec doesn't get initialized until you've run your RC scripts, which is a very long time in, for a computer. Um, so obviously doing this stuff in the loader was very important, but until very recently, it wasn't possible, and I'll get into that in a minute. But the key thing here is that the loader is a very limited environment compared to the kernel in New Zealand. Um, the file system support is minimal. And generally speaking, it deals with each file that it cares about only once. So our efficiency concerns are different. Uh, we're much more interested in keeping things small and simple versus uh, having to worry about uh, running stuff multiple times. So our goals are to verify everything possible. Uh, we want to allow for mutable um, loader.com files, um, just because within our packages we may have a mutable loader.conf snippets. We still want to allow for the user to create a loader.conf that sets some knobs and hints and other things that they want. And that's obviously not going to be signed. And we don't want to have that upset things too much. We also want to allow for tunable behavior. And think about that. I'll get into why that doesn't end up biting us in the butt. Um, and we want to retain the flexibility of those X509 certificate chains, um, because uh, most existing uh, methods of doing this level of verification this early in the boot tend to be very inflexible in terms of the signing methods used. Uh, and we definitely didn't want that. Um, and uh, as I said, we want to keep it small, um, minimum impact on boot time. Uh, let's see. And we want, we want the loader to find, just as it finds all those modules and everything else easily enough, we want it to be able to find the manifests automatically as well. Um, so we, want, we don't need an elaborate data store like the kernel users for, for the user land stuff. We want a very simple data store. And in fact, since we have to read the whole manifest into memory for the purpose of verifying it, because that lets you guarantee it can't be tampered with after you've done the ver you know, avoids race conditions. Yes, I verified it. Now I open it. And whoops, it might have changed. Um, so you've got to have it in memory anyway. So we just use that as our data store. And we just end up with a linked list of these blobs of memory which happen to contain the content of the manifest. And that's, that's it. It's very simple. We do need to track things by path name. So in the kernel, we track them by dev, inode, and such, because the kernel, by the time you get down there, he has no idea what the path name is anyway. Um, in the loader, he only knows about the path name. Um, so this is a strictly path name-based lookup, and that actually works to our advantage, uh, which we'll get into later on. He does track by dev and inode whether or not he's verified a file, um, because obviously, we don't want to do any work more than once, um, because that would hurt our boot times. Um, and because of that, we need to, tr in our linked list when we're storing the manifests, we keep them in a most recently added and the longest prefix um, first, uh, which gives us the best chance of finding the correct entry when we're looking for something. All right, I mentioned before that I haven't been able to do this for 15 years, and this is why. Um, so uh, last year, Thomas Porin gave a talk here about Bear SSL. It's a very new library. Um, it's very tiny. Um, it's designed for embedded environments. It works very nicely. Um, the library itself does no memory allocations. 
Uh, it provides all of the functionality that we need for um, verifying X509 certificates. Uh, it's written in fourth, um, but there are tools in the ports collection that make it relatively straightforward to fiddle with the fourth, regenerate the C, um, and back and forth, I've verified that all works. So that's, that's okay. And it's at least an order of magnitude smaller than OpenSSL. Uh, last time I tried to whittle down OpenSSL to just the bits I would need for doing verifying of uh, X509 certificate chains, I got it down to about three megabytes and then gave up. Um, depending on your, your previous boot stage, you might be limited to 640K for the loader. So three megabytes into 640K is a bit of a squeeze. Um, with bare SSL, the entire implementation of this added approximately 100K to the size of the loader. Um, it's a fairly significant difference. Um, so I mentioned that we, we're keeping the, the manifest itself as our data store. Um, we keep it in a link, we just keep them in a linked list. The, the goal is to be as simple as possible here. So we have a, a list of fingerprint info entries. There's a, there's a data pointer there, which is our actual manifest data. We track the prefix that we found that manifest at so that we can keep the list ordered by longest prefix first, um, because we also need to use that when we're trying to find files, which I'll go into in a minute. Um, we keep track of um, a skip field. It's a dreadful name, but naming stuff is hard. Um, I'll explain what that's for in a minute. Um, and we also uh, keep track of the device that we found this manifest on so that, um, in the case of Junos at least, we end up reading two files called slash boot slash loader RC from two different devices. And so we need to make sure that we look in the right manifest for each of them. Um, all right, I have to keep mentioning FIPS. For FIPS, you have to run known answer tests before you do anything that involves anything that FIPS might care about. So. When the loader first starts, he runs known answer tests for each of the hash methods that we're going to use and for each of the signature methods that we're going to use. So basically, for each of our trust anchors, we'll verify one of the intermediate CAs. And all of these public keys are burned into the loader. Um, it's a fairly simple process. And you'll notice at the end that I, for grins and giggles, I did add OpenPGP support for this as well. Um, X509 works wonderfully for vendors like uh, Juniper and probably the FreeBSD organization. But if you're doing this on your own box, uh, OpenPGP is far simpler. Uh, let's see. All right, so we're going to talk about booting. BSDX is what we refer to our modern Junos uh, using FreeBSD 10 onwards. Um, this is interesting because it's a much more complicated complicated boot process than normal FreeBSD, largely because of the way we support multiple sets of packages installed at the same time. And you can easily uh, select the boot set that you want to boot from. Um, you can achieve the same sort of thing with boot environments and ZFS and all that sort of thing, but obviously we don't have that on tiny embedded devices. So the Lotus sees a path like that for the kernel. Um, but the, the boot directory there is actually a sim link to a subdirectory of um, a directory in the packages database. So this is the actual path that he's going to be looking in. And he needs to find the manifest. Um, but he's not going to find a manifest in the directory where he thinks the kernel is. But we, we have him look for, um, whoops, did I skip a slide there? Let me go back. Might have gone too far. That's right. Um, but we make him look for a dot dot slash manifest, which is how it works. And this, here's a quick tease on what it looks like as it's booting. Um, this is with verbose on, so that it actually, this is actually very wonderful for uh, debugging because you get to see every file that the loader is loading. Um, without this, sometimes when you're debugging some crazy platform problem, um, you don't know. You've no idea why the loader goes crazy, and it's because somebody's got a you know their own init dot fourth, which is doing something crazy. Um, so it's, it can be really handy to see all this stuff, but it'll slow the boot down. So by default, we a lot of this is suppressed. Um, but you will see here, for instance, we report when we get an unverified file, um, and that can, that may or may not be a problem depending on 
the, the way we're configured. The API to the loader is very simple. There's essentially one function that the loader calls from various places it's called, strangely enough, verify file. Um, we pass in a file descriptor, um, the file name that, that we're wanting to verify, the current offset, and the severity arg is an indication of the caller's, um, what's the word, how much the caller cares about this thing being verified. Um, generally speaking, we want to avoid calling this until the loader has already decided that he wants the file. So in the case of, a lot of, uh, in, in the case of modules, for instance, he'll have opened the module, he'll do a bit of tasting of it to see what it is, decide that he wants it, and he's already read part of the file at that point. So that's when he calls this thing. So we need to rewind the file to the start, read the whole thing to computer hash, and then we need to rewind it back to the original offset before we return so that the loader can continue without getting too upset. Um, and then verify file calls a bunch of other routines which actually do the, the verification stuff. Um, and I'll, we can talk about it in more detail if anybody's actually interested. Um, we want to keep track of whether or not we've verified anything already. This is especially important for the manifests because uh, when you have multiple files in a given directory with the same manifest, if we don't do anything else, he's going to keep loading and verifying that manifest multiple times. So we keep track of what we've verified and whether it was successful. Uh, and for that, we need stino and stdev. Um, in, uh, in libstand, the, the library that the loader uses to replace an operating system, uh, the, the UFS support, at least, is very minimal. The stack call didn't populate any of these structures, any of these members, and so you're, you're looking at random numbers, which is not so useful. So I had to add support for STINO and STDEV. And STDEV is particularly troublesome because there's none of the underlying uh, OS support, and so the best that I was able to come up is is cramming the file system's ID, which is a 64-bit number, into SDDEV, which is a 32-bit number. Uh, just XOR them together. It seems to do the trick. Um, and obviously, if you fail to verify the manifest, nothing that it refers to is verified. And so when you go to load the kernel, you, you find the manifest that it's referring to. If you've already l tried to load that manifest and it failed to verify it, then you don't need to waste time on the kernel. It's failed. Um, so back to, back to the process of finding stuff. We're looking for packages, sets, active, boot, OS kernel, kernel. Um, the manifest, as we saw earlier, is actually in the parent directory of the, the immediate directory. And we will find that easily just by looking for dot dot slash manifest. Um, he goes to verify that using the provided. Um, so we've got eSIG, so there'll be a, that eSerts file, which contains the certificate chain. He verifies that. And the routine that does the verification, if it succeeds, returns a buffer containing the, the manifest content. And it's then a straightforward process to stick that into our linked list, uh, along with a record of where we found it. And as I say, we always record the status of the verification. And I just said that. Um, one thing that was a little bit uh, annoying, with OpenSSL, when you're verifying certificates, you get to have a callback that will be called if any problems are encountered. And your callback can say, yes, I know the certificate's expired. I don't care. Um, so. As an embedded vendor, we absolutely care about enforcing certificate restrictions when we're doing software install. But once software is on the box, we do not ever want it to stop working just because the guy hasn't done an upgrade in 10 years. Um, it's amazing how upset customers get if that sort of thing happens, um, especially when you're running the core of the internet. Uh, let's see. So the load, um, and unfortunately, the loader has no real concept of time. He's, we haven't initialized clocks and all those sort of things. Um, but what we can do is we can use the M time field of the, the stat return, which I had to add, but it's there, so that was easy. And we can tell bare SSL, um, here's the time to use to verify this 
this certificate, uh, which is lucky because it provides no provision for ignoring the expiry um, time. I did actually modify the fourth and go through the exercise to see if I could make it do that, and I could, but it was a crappy idea, so this is a much better way to do it. Um, open PGP, I mentioned, um, is, you know, if you're wanting to verify stuff on your own box, it's uh, probably a neater solution for, so just for the purpose of upstreaming, um, I added support for open PGP. Uh, we don't plan to use it ourselves. Uh, let's see. Verify file, I mentioned calls, verify FD, which is in um, uh, uh, one of the libraries. He goes and looks up the path name. He looks through his linked list of manifests to find one that looks like it's got a prefix that might match the file name that you're looking for. Um, and if you recall the manifest list, the, the package list that I showed before, all the manifest entries have things like boot slash kernel. But there was no boot directory where the kernel was found. And so what we need to do is tell the loader when you're going to do this lookup in the manifest, ignore the boot bit. Um, and so he actually manages to find the correct entry. And when he finds the correct entry, he ends up with a pointer to a specification of what kind of hash it is and what the expected value is. And that makes it easy for him to then go and call an appropriate routine to hash the file, compare it using the appropriate method, and let us know if it matches. And again, we record the success or failure. And failure can happen for a number of reasons. The one that we really care about is if you found a matching manifest entry, you found a hash value, you hash the file, and they don't match. That's always a, a case of failure. We, we are never going to accept that. Um, when we, when we do fail, we're going to return to the caller that we failed. And uh, so it will, the loader, the rest of the loader will just stop loading the file at that point. That may result in a catastrophic failure of your system, or it may just, it may be a fairly inconsequential file that you can carry on with. Um, so that's, that's uh, how it is. The other, the other main reason for failure is that we didn't find a manifest entry. Um, and that may or may not be something that we need to get upset about. If the file was a loader.conf or a hints file or a cookie file, we probably don't care about the fact that we couldn't find a fingerprint for it. If it was a um, module, though, we will be upset. Um, the, other, the only other reason we have for failure is uh, this one where it says unknown. That means we found a manifest entry but we couldn't recognize a fingerprint in there. Um, now, in the case of, uh, I only, I've only hit this when I was trying to boot our legacy Junos using the latest loader, because the manifest that was being loaded had entries for things which didn't have fingerprints. Um, but the other reason that, that could happen is if you've got a really old loader and you're loading a manifest which is using some new hash method that the loader doesn't know about. Um, in which case, um, that's not so good. Um, it's not particularly likely because we're not planning to support anything beyond SHA-256, and the loader knows how to do that. So for all intents and purposes, the unknown and none found are the same thing. Now, uh, the caller passes in this severity argument that I mentioned before. That, that is all for the purpose of what to do when you get this case of, I didn't find a, a fingerprint. Um, many of the callers in the loader have no idea what the file is that they're opening, especially if they've been called from a bit of fourth in loader RC, who's just said, open this file. The, the C code in the loader doesn't know what the file is. All he can do is pass along the file name, and in those cases, he'll pass along this, hey, I'm guessing, you, you work it out. And so the verified file routine will have a look at the extension. And if it's, dot, if it's um, dot .com for hints and so on, he'll say, OK, we'll try to verify it, but we won't get upset. Um, if it's anything other than that, then he'll, he'll say, hey, I, I want this to be signed. Um, and then 
the V mus1 is used by load elf. So modules are always called via a path that knows that it's a module and it will always pass in this. It, this has to be signed. Um, and then uh, if, depending on the, the severity, if we do find that we don't have a fingerprint, um, it's a little bit of math to see whether or not the severity is less than or equal to the threshold that we've set. So depending on how strict we're configured to be, um, we might accept want as being unsigned, um, or we might only accept the, the try case as being unsigned. And then if you, if you got a want entry that uh, needs to be signed because of your threshold configuration and it's not, then we return failure. I hope that's clear. Um, and obviously for FIPS, we want strict enforcement. Uh, so in that case, when we, we, when we uh, are told to be strict, um, we're going to go back and ask those uh, self-test routines, did you succeed? And if you don't, we're going to panic. Um, and we also set our threshold that anything, everything at want or um, uh, above needs to be signed. So how do we configure the loader to have this tunable behavior without completely compromising our security? I mean, if you can get to the loader prompt and you can say, hey, be strict, or hey, turn it off, it's not very useful. So obviously we don't do that. But as I mentioned earlier, the verification process here is strictly path name based. So when we verify a file, we're not just verifying its content, we're actually verifying its path name as well. Um, and we can take advantage of that. So what we have for Junos is we have these little uh, loader tweak packages, and all they do is they contain a little init.forth, um, which contains, uh, which is going to try and open a file with a specific name, and the name is things like loader.ve.strict. And the loader, he knows he's just verified a file, so he can trust the path name. He can look at the path name, and if he recognizes this prefix of loader.ve, he knows that the rest of the path name is information for him to use. And so if he sees strict, he's going to put himself into strict mode. He's going to go and, as I say, check whether or not the self-test uh, passed. And if they didn't, he's going to panic. And he'll raise the threshold of what we'll accept as unsigned to want. Um, we do actually have one for turning it off. Um, a lot of data center customers uh, think that they're safe behind their firewalls and all the rest of it, and they just want the fastest boot time they can get. And so, OK. And this, doesn't, this won't get turned off immediately, but it does get turned off before you start loading any modules, which is where all the expense really comes in. So verifying a few files up till you find this thing adds very little overhead. Uh, which brings us on to the topic of performance. So as I mentioned before, the, the, the way the loader loads modules in particular is not very conducive to hashing. Um, he, he reads a bit, he skips a bit, he reads a bit, he skips a bit. Um, and for computing a hash, that's not going to work. We need to read the whole file sequentially in order to get the same hash that the build system produced when it uh, created the manifest. Um, for small files like the loader.coms and things like that, totally doesn't matter. Um, they're very small. For modules and the kernel and his initial root file system, um, it does. Um, and for Junos, booting off Compact Flash, um, the current method uh, uh, adds about 3% overhead. So that's like you know six seconds on a, a two-minute boot or something like that. Um, it's not dreadful. I mean, it's tolerable, but uh, we can do better. And there's actually an API provided in the library to do that. Um, this library, uh, sorry, this API allows us to read, uh, to read the file and compute the hash as a side effect of reading. And the only real trick here is that when, when the guy calls a seek, we actually do a read. Um, so if he asks you to seek ahead, you know, three pages, we'll read those pages and compute the hash and, and say, yep, I, se I seek to wherever you wanted. Um, and then we actually do the hash comparison when the close call happens. Um, apart from the need for extensive rework of loader.elf to use this API, 
Um, a big difference between this API and the other one is by the time you decide that you've failed to verify the file, you've already loaded the whole thing into memory, uh, which might be dangerous. So uh, generally speaking, uh, if this thing fails, we panic, um, which is suboptimal. Um, but it doesn't matter because I've not done the work to introduce this. Um, I'm leaving it as a Google Summer of Code project for somebody. Yeah, it doesn't care what the hash function is. When we, when we do the manifest lookup, it sees what hash it needs to use. And so, um, and oh, sorry. Yes, when, when you do the open, he, that's when he goes to do the manifest lookup to find the hash method that he needs to compute. And if it's a file that doesn't need any hashing, then all of these routines just call the, the real equivalents. They don't actually do anything. So it's, again, bypasses any effort. It's in, the, it's in the library, but the changes in the loader itself are not done because that's a much more extensive chain set, which is probably not appropriate for the first enablement. Um, and of course, this is only used for modules. Um, so uh, it's very unlikely that you would be wanting to use this and have an unsigned file. So we probably want to fail immediately. Um, the loader itself is version agnostic. I've actually used the stable 11 loader to boot a system that's effectively stable 6 or something like that. Um, that's nice because, um, again, if you're doing the whole secure boot thing, the prior boot stage uh, will have its own Baroque method for wanting to verify the loader. Um, and the whole point of this is we don't really Given that the loader lets us have maximum flexibility once it gets running, we don't really care how bizarre and baroque the method to verify the loader itself is. Um, but we can imagine that it's painful, and so being able to build the loader once, sign it in whatever bizarre way once, stick it on a shelf and reuse it for the next five years is an attractive proposition. Um, and so the fact that it doesn't care whether it's loading stable 6 or stable 11 um, is nice. And that brings us to questions. Yes? Do you have to modify any entry for this? Um, so do you not, uh, strictly speaking, no. Oh, I did add a, an explicit uh, manifest type to the load command. Um, we don't use it in this version of Junos, but for experimenting with our legacy platforms where they still have manifests, but they're in completely unrelated places, so it would be insane to try and make the loader find them automatically. Uh, in that case, you can write a loader.rc or something to say, hey, load minus t manifest, whatever the path name is, and you can, it lets you set all of the uh, fields of that uh, structure that we use to track the manifest. Um, but no, for this itself, no changes to any of the, the fourth or anything like that. But obviously, you would have got the impression uh, we have made massive changes to the fourth stuff for booting this sort of system anyway. Um, but if you were trying to do this in like stock FreeBSD, no, about all you would want to do is have a, an it.fourth or loader.rc or something that went and lo explicitly loaded a manifest, and you'd probably be good to go. Yes? I haven't. Um, I was talking to somebody yesterday or the day before who mentioned that it was quicker than doing SHA-256. Yeah. Um, we're hoping to stick with SHA-1 for as long as possible. Um, but once, once we have to do SHA-256, then um, yeah, we'll, we'll want to look at, at that. Yeah. Uh, so the yeah the so the repeat the question please certainly the question was uh, what about adding other hacks and mash hashes and so on um, totally don't care um, the way it's currently structured is that's relatively straightforward um, they should all be if deft so that people can build it with just the support that they want um, 
in our case, we are only going to be enabling things that are FIPS certifiable. Um, so none of the RIPM and all those other things are of interest to us. Yes? So the thing where you put the file system ID to a 32-bit number, um, so I guess that means that in order to somebody could trick your loader if they created another file system whose this range and this range and XOR were the same and had the same inode numbers, but your loader is something that is under your customer's control anyway. Like this is not something that the TPM is No. Um, so if someone were to do that trick, effectively the way they would be creating a denial of service attack because the system wouldn't boot um, unless they could also craft a, a file that um, magically um, had a, you know, if they, could com if they could force a hash collision and do that other stuff, then they might have something. If you, yeah, if you can manage to, to if you can manage to produce a hash collision, then yes, you've got a hash collision and the world stops. Um, because that, that's only interesting if you've managed to produce a, an evil kernel that matches a verified kernel. Um, and the whole point of all this crypto stuff is that that's supposed to be infeasible. Um, uh, that was right. Yes, John. Jonathan. Yeah. How do you keep someone, an attacker, from copying that to another router and then disabling it on another router? Um, so uh, we have a number of discussions going on around stuff like this. Um, on our platforms that have TPMs, um, we're considering, um, so the, the, on the platforms that have secure boot, sorry, doesn't necessarily need a TPM. Um, they have a revocation database for stuff that's been revoked. You can actually revoke stuff that was never in existence. Um, and so we're considering using methods like revoking the ability to install um, some of these tweak packages so that you could prevent somebody from installing that thing. Um, and, the, and obviously, uh, if we're running a box in FIPS mode or something like that, we would we would catch that even before you got that far. Um, the other thing I was going to mention uh, when we mentioned TBMs before, um, I'm, I'm going to, when I get home, I'm, I was going to make a chat. I was considering whether or not we should be uh, feeding a TPM the hashes as we compute them. Um, from discussions, that would be prohibitively expensive, uh, given the amount of code to talk to a TPM. But we can actually compute a running hash and give it to the kernel once we're finished, say, by the way, this is what you want to give the TPM if you're doing measured boot. And so we can, we can achieve measured boot uh, with very little overhead uh, as far as the load is concerned. Anybody else? Anybody, anybody scratching the head wondering what measured boot versus secure boot is? OK, so secure boot is very simple. So a lot of people, they, these things get conflated. Um, a lot of people think you can't have secure boot without a TPM, or that you know, a TPM magically gives you secure boot. They're almost completely orthogonal. You can have secure boot. Um, all, all secure boot typically means is every step in the process of booting has verified the next step, um, which is why the load of verifying the kernel and modules is important. Um, TPM has absolutely nothing to do with that. What a TPM can let you do, though, is what's called measured boot, which lets you, and in that case, what you do is, as you're booting, you compute hashes and you tell the TPM, by the way, I want you to update uh, one of your registers with this hash. And the TPM has a means of um, keeping track of those things in a way that can't be fiddled with. And at the end of the process, you can say, OK, TPM, what was the resulting hash that you got? And 
then you can go and check whether or not it's the one you wanted. And that lets you know that you booted with a s configuration set that actually matched what you wanted. So Cure Boot can verify that everything that you loaded was verified, but it doesn't mean you booted with the set of stuff that you wanted. So you can actually use the combination of measured boot and secure boot to do lots of things. And the TPM also then allows you to do what's called um, uh, remote attestation, where um, Jonathan might want to know whether or not I booted with the, the right set of stuff. And he can do a query to me. He'll send me some, some info, and I'll send him a signed response along with um, my PCR registers, which identify how I booted. And he can verify from that whether or not I actually booted with the configuration that I was supposed to. And that's really cool for customers like, for people like us who want to send out boxes to customers who then want to have the box turn on, go and contact some central service to get their configuration and all that stuff. And both parties want to assure, be assured that they're talking to the right sort of entity. Any other questions? All right, thank you for your time.